Ladies and gentlemen, we are now ready for our next discussion. Cyber criminals are using the global instability to their advantage. The number of cyber attacks rose dramatically because of the pandemic. How does the crisis affect the threat landscape during these times? What is to be expected from cyber criminals in the upcoming months and years? How can we stop them? I am now joined by two experts who know all about that. Wendy Whitmore, Vice President of IBM X-Force Threat Intelligence, and Danya Takkar, Vice President AMEA at Trend Micro. Wendy, Danya, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you. My first question is to both of you. What changes do you see in the behavior of cyber criminals? What methods or techniques do they use? Is there something new to highlight? Wendy, could you please go first? Absolutely. Well, first, I want to say thank you uh, for having me today and hello to our attendees all over the world. Uh, thanks for joining. So one of the things I think is, is most interesting is just how the landscape has shifted a bit over the last few months, right, with the pandemic. And in particular, what we've seen now is a shift in the global workforce to be working from home. And we've seen even further disruption in recent weeks due to social unrest in multiple areas all over the world. And so the cybersecurity landscape, as a result, I think attackers are taking advantage of that unrest as well, right? They find themselves in a suddenly very rich environment with potential victims all over the world that are actually using less secure devices in more quantity and those connections as well potentially being less secure and they're feeling disoriented by the sudden shift in their routines and a heightened desire for more information about what's going on in the world around them. So as a result of all of those things, right, we've now seen a spike in email attacks that are using COVID-19 related themes um, that are intended to lure anxious or overstressed employees. And um, by some of the measures that we're tracking, we've actually seen these spam attacks increase as much as 14% globally. So um, that said, that's a, that's a pretty high likelihood, right, with that increase in volume, that you're going to reach some victims that are going to open uh, those emails, unfortunately. So one of the things I think we're looking at, um, looking forward to talking about today more is just some of the insights into that landscape, some of the things that we've been tracking from the IBM X-Force. Um, recently, we, re we released a cloud uh, security special intelligence report and then sharing some perspectives on how organizations in both the private and public sector can share information more effectively. Thank you, Wendy. Danya, do you have anything to add to that? What trends do you see? Yeah, first of all, again, you know, thanks Alexander for having me and uh, really hope that next year, you know, again, I can, uh, I can be in Moscow um, at this event uh, in person. You know, as Wendy said, you know, there's really little surprise that the criminal underground and the cyber criminals will, you know, capitalize on the pandemic for their own gain. And I really like to look at it from two different perspectives. You know, one is, you know, what's visible and tangible and to a certain extent trackable. And whether you look at the IBM's X-Force, you know, results or Trend Micro's, you know, global threat intelligence uh, data, I mean, as Wendy said, you know, it's really clear that with uh, there's been an increase in spam messages, you know, malware, um, sharp increase, about 260% increase in the malicious URL and all related to COVID-19. Um, and 70% of, of, you know, such, of, such visible things are related to spam or, or phishing emails and rest are, you know, malware and malicious URL. And of course, you know, this is, really all very common in the sense that we expected it, which is, you know, emails coming in, pretending to be coming from WHO, you know, uh, claiming to have updates on COVID-19, the COVID-19 heat maps, um, you know, asking for donations and such things. But the part which is, um, I call it, you know, below the iceberg, right? Which is, which is, there are certainly things that are that are below the line that may not be as visible uh, to everyone uh, of our audience out there, and that is really, you know, uh, the targeted attacks and and um, 
you know, what we are seeing is, is there are a number of attacks that are going on, which are very sophisticated, you know, using very sophisticated ransomware, such as any film or maze. And really the goal here is not just to extort the money, but actually to bring down, you know, the, either the critical infrastructure or exfiltrate, you know, critical data uh, from that victimized organizations and, and uh, you know, leverage this. And on top of that, the reality is, you know, the cyber criminals are targeting the companies that are affected the worst, um, those that are strapped for funds or resources. And as we all know, there are a number of companies that are struggling uh, due to this, this pandemic, and they may not have the budget or the resources. And so really what we are finding is um, that our incident response teams have been completely inundated with, uh, with these kinds of uh, you know, large scale attacks um, where we are working very hard to help and recover the organization from this heightened rate uh, wave of cyber attacks during this pandemic. Thank you, Danya. Wendy, my next question is for you. Cloud technologies are gaining momentum, especially when remote operations are expanding. What are the main threats for companies who use such technologies and how should they address them? Yeah, great question. So there's no doubt there's been a huge shift, right, to in many organizations worldwide uh, to really working in the cloud, right? And there are so many benefits to that. Uh, we're certainly huge proponents of that. But with that, it also uh, makes the reality that you need to continue to be concerned about security. And I think that sometimes there's a mind shift in that uh, if we're moving our data into the cloud, then it, technology and security is someone else's responsibility. And unfortunately, that's not the case, right? Organizations still need to take leadership and responsibility for protecting themselves. So uh, I mentioned previously that we just released a cloud security report and we saw some themes that I I, I don't find surprising and I, I don't think they'll probably surprise too many people, but they're things like, you know, financial gain, right? So attackers exploiting data that they can then sell or monetize in some sort of fashion that still is really the number one objective when you're looking at the cloud type of data breaches and attacks that we're seeing. Um, data theft, again, typically data theft related to the wholesale theft of intellectual property or the theft of data that, again, can be monetized in some form or fashion, that continues to be uh, a huge trend in those attacks. In terms of the ways attackers are getting into those environments, we still see a hugely disproportionate amount of misconfiguration going on in those environments that attackers are taking advantage of. The other thing is that, um, you know, we released a report earlier this year where we talked about kind of attack vectors. And one of the more disturbing trends that applies to the cloud security landscape is that about 60% of the attacks we see are actually leveraging data that's already been stolen somewhere else. So stolen credentials that have been as part of a previous breach or maybe a vulnerability that's been previously exploited and can be patched. And again, it's due to some either misconfiguration or lack of patching. And so the reality is that especially with as, as cloud uh, continues to spread and more data gets hosted there, it's even more critical than ever for organizations to make sure that we're doing things like practicing good hygiene, changing passwords, all of those things. And as Danya mentioned, ransomware is huge, right? We continue to see these types of attacks over and over again. And we have seen even more in an exponential degree uh, during this pandemic. And so we continue to have teams of um, our consultants who are all over the world really looking at how do we respond to these successfully. And some of them are extortion related. Some of them are you know, intellectual property theft related and maybe have a different financial element to them. But unfortunately, everyone at this point is pretty susceptible to those types of attacks whether your data is hosted on site or in the cloud, it all comes back to how we effectively can secure the data. Thank you, Wendy. Danya, we know that in light of the pandemic, Trend Micro has opened Trend Micro Cybersecurity and Coronavirus Resource Center. We've also seen that your company has been analyzing malware that appeared during the crisis and you also engaged in other activities. Can you share with us what are the most important and maybe even surprising things that you've discovered in the process? Yeah, and you know, um, this resource center is is just one of the things, but I believe that every vendor, right, whether it's Trend Micro, uh, I know certainly know IBM's doing a lot of work. Like we have a responsibility um, 
not just from a research perspective, but to do as much as possible to help organizations out in, in this time. Um, certainly, you know, uh, your question specifically around the research, um, you know, the findings uh, mostly have been in line with, with what we, one would expect, right? Um, which is, uh, and we've seen this, whenever there is a global crisis or an event of a public significance, there's, you know, always an uptake in, in you know, criminal toolkits, knowledge exchanges, and purchase behaviors related to such events. So it's understandable that people out there are clicking on emails or website links or report downloads that promise uh, to provide updates to such events and therefore being lured into, into certain things. And, COVID-19 is no exceptions, right? Um, it's also expected, right? Uh, or it is, it was kind of expected that as organizations uh, and as um, as people uh, workforce shift to, you know, working from home, that there will be cybersecurity challenges. Uh, and many organizations were found unprepared for, for those challenges. And part of it is because you know, stay at home networks are, are the targets. Uh, they are more typically more exposed than the company networks. Um, and, you know, again, there's a lot of evidence that shows that remote working increases that risk of a successful ransomware attack uh, significantly, partly due to the combination of that weaker security controls at home network than, than your, you know, company's uh, network. But um, there's definitely uh, the unexpected part. And, and what I found a um, little bit unexpected is how often uh, organizations, you know, made compromises to their security posture uh, in order to accommodate this flexible remote working uh, from home arrangements. For example, typically, you know, the applications that will not be permitted in a corporate network uh, were allowed to operate in a, in a uh, so-called, you know, weaker uh, environment or, you know, compromises on, on VPN. And combine that with the fact that the IT teams are now tasked with managing incidents in this unfamiliar conditions where playbooks don't really cater to such operating modes. That's really what you know, has caught a lot of organizations off guard. And certainly, you know, one of the things uh, we are doing more than just the, the resource center is, um, you know, and as I mentioned in previously that our IR teams, uh, incident response teams have been really busy. Uh, during this time, especially in, in the region I manage, which is, you know, Asia, Middle East and Africa, we've made our incident response completely free to organizations that are that are really looking for, for help. And again, it's just one little thing, but hopefully, you know, in this kind of situation, it will help um, some of the organizations who are who are seeing this kind of, you know, cybersecurity challenges. Thank you, Danya. I have one more question to both of you. Who do you think is the main target of cyber criminals in 2020? Companies or people? Which sectors are under biggest threat and why? Wendy, what do you think? Yeah, great question. So, you know, I think unfortunately the answer is a little bit of everyone, right? So we're really looking at um, cyber criminals in particular are looking to take data that they can then monetize, right? Or they're looking to steal data that is a monetary currency. And so from both of those approaches, you're going to see different types of attacks, right? Part of it on the consumer side is just gonna be a general quantity of types of attacks and trying to reach as many people as possible. And that's where you see a lot of those spam attack increases, the emails related to that, anything you know from the World Health Organization or the Center for Disease Control, those are the types of email lures that are gonna really be impacting consumers more or less. When we shift to the corporate environment, so I think we're really looking at as Danya mentioned earlier, critical infrastructure being huge, huge targets. And in this case, that's everyone from healthcare organizations who are actually providing life-saving services in some cases, or in many cases, to financial services industries, to energy and oil and gas. And all of those organizations are potential victims. And ultimately, you know, when we look at, again, the types of attacks perpetuated by cyber criminals in particular, we're really seeing ransomware be a huge part of that problem. And you know, some of the things we've seen recently with ransomware attacks are even more disturbing 
in the sense that I think a few years ago we would see attacks that maybe I, you know, I mentioned quantity before, right? So you had ransomware um, actors who were part of larger cyber criminal gangs and were maybe looking to make money off of a large volume or quantity of attacks, but weren't asking huge dollar amounts and didn't seemingly always were that targeted, right, of their attacks. Now what we're seeing is organizations where the attackers have been in there for months, if not longer, and they've really understood and taken their time patiently to understand the lay of the land and then determined when and where they can wage a ransomware attack, deploy the, the software, and then ask for the most money, basically, based on the data that they've encrypted. And in some cases, we've seen recently as much as uh, 25 million US dollars be asked as um, part of the ransom. So those numbers have significantly increased. And again, I think all organizations need to be prepared. There's a lot of ways we can do that. And I'm sure we're gonna talk about that next. But um, again, I, I think all organizations, but specifically those in critical infrastructure really need to be looking at how they can effectively defend their environments. Wow, so everybody's on the radar of cyber criminals. That sounds scary. Dania, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, Wendy uh, really hit the hammer on the nail here, right? Like um, everyone um, is a target and, you know, whether it's companies or individuals, um, certainly we know that, uh, you know, typically the corporate networks are typically more hardened and better protected than home network. Um, so it's really, you know, at times could be harder to break into a corporate network, but at the same time, the yield is a lot more than attacking, you know, individual users or consumers. So. Um, I think you know that's a that's a balance that um, that um, uh, cyber criminals are really you know trying to to walk through. But the reality is um, everyone is uh, is a potential um, target here. Now, uh, certainly, what's more important, and Wendy touched upon it, right? Within, if, if everyone's a, a target, right? Who is uh, uh, who has? Um, uh, who has a more target than, than others. And really, I'd like to say that from uh, uh, sectors. And typically, you know, the five sectors that we see are, are even more increased target is healthcare. Certainly, you know, the amount of attacks that we are seeing on healthcare is unprecedented. And it's really sad to see that because that's a, uh, that's a segment that's actually doing the best to help out uh, in the pandemic, but they really are the ones are hurting a lot in, in from a from a cyber criminal perspective, and certainly you know the the four other sectors that I wanted to point out, uh, which you know typically always come up in the in the top uh, targeted industries for cybercrime would be financial services, government, uh, IT and telecom, and the fourth one is is manufacturing. Sometimes it, in in certain countries it may not show up in the top. But we see manufacturing and healthcare, especially these days, because you know a lot of them are still using outdated systems. Um, they typically, you know, their their IT uh, structure is set up in a way that making them slower to respond or detect or respond to a breach. And and uh, you know, really, it's unfortunate. But yeah, like this is the world we are living in, where anyone and everyone is a target. Thank you, Dania. I have a few questions that we received on cyberpolygon.com website. And the first one is for Wendy. Is it possible to organize threat intelligence exchange across countries and industries? And if yes, how can we get there? Yeah, that's a great question. So that's something that I think both of our organizations are probably doing pretty well, right? Certainly better than we've done um, in decades prior. And the reality is that technology really influences that. And I think the great thing about, you know, we've kind of painted this negative picture, right, in these attacks. But the good thing about these attacks is that we've rarely seen anything so new and so novel that we're not really ready to defend against them, right? And many organizations are doing that very successfully. And in particular, those that are doing it successfully are ones that have threat intelligence um, that are, are tailored towards their industry. They have a good understanding of what their particular attack surface looks like. Uh, the ways that organizations are sharing that has become pretty 
rapid, right? So across industry, across verticals, different geos, uh, our team in particular, right? We've got uh, language specialists in all kinds of different areas and technologies and attack sectors. And so the way that that's done primarily is through a variety of virtual technologies. I think one of the most important things though that we've seen organizations do when they're successful at operationalizing that threat intelligence is that they actually have an incident response plan. They're testing it. And as Donya mentioned, now things have changed where maybe your uh, workforce was actually on site. So your threat intelligence analysts, your incident responders were perhaps working out of an office facility or a variety of them around the world. And now you've actually got them all working from home in different locations. And so it's really critical that those plans are tested, that you know how to get a hold of your personnel, especially in the wake of it, a crisis where perhaps your initial and primary communication mechanisms fail. So all of that is related to having robust uh, access to threat intelligence that's specifically tailored towards the types of attacks that you're likely going to see. Thank you, Wendy. There's one more question, and this one is addressed to Dania specifically. Have you seen this spike in the number of attacks in any particular region or country? Uh, interesting question. You know, let's let's um, step back a little bit, right? So, if you think in terms of a lot of organizations on one side, they are suddenly forced into this working from home, and as I mentioned, you know, this particular uh, CISO who mentioned you know, thirty-five thousand users suddenly working from home and creates a completely different challenge. So from a, from those who are in an organization who are given the responsibility to guard, um, really are trying to deal with how do I guard in a situation where, you know, everyone's working from home and, and you know, a lot of, um, there's there's a, this increased activity from cyber criminals. On the other side, if you look at it from a business owner, uh, the CEOs are thinking in terms of, hey, as this COVID-19 situation is still, you know, uh, there's there's still a long way to go. Um, how can I pivot myself? And therefore, they are looking at uh, cloud transformation projects. They are ramping up uh, that when I when we come out of this situation, how can we really, you know, stay ahead in terms of our competition within our market, and how quickly can we come back up? And therefore, they are really increasing. Uh, at least the activity is increasing in terms of uh, how to how to you know speed up those cloud transformation projects. So you sort of end up in this situation where on one side you have to defend and you have to do a good job at, at defense while you don't have a lot of things that you had before. And on the other side, you know, organizations are trying to you know accelerate on on certain areas. So the reality is, it depends on. Within a country, you know, you might see certain sectors or certain companies which are which are really, you know, trying to move fast. Uh, and as Wendy said, it's really, you know, cross geographies, cross vertical, cross industries. Um, there isn't really okay, you know, here's a country uh, that is that is particularly struggling, or here's a vertical that is, you know, it's within those countries and within those uh, verticals. Whoever is um, either was caught off guard in terms of defense or is trying to move fast is the one uh, really, you know, facing some of the challenges. Dania, thank you for sharing this information with us. Unfortunately, we're almost out of time here. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? Wendy? Uh, you know what? I, I enjoyed getting to speak to everyone today, so really appreciate it. And as Danya mentioned, I'd love the opportunity to get to meet everyone in person, ideally next year. Uh, but if you've got questions, or you want to follow up with us, I think we'd love to answer some more questions. So please let us know, and we'll look forward to doing that. Danya? Yeah, no, uh, pleasure's been ours. And, and really, you know, these are unprecedented times, and... Um, we all, um, and I say this even on behalf of Wendy and you know every other security vendor, uh, we are here to help. Uh, we really want to make sure that you know the world is um, is better in terms of exchanging you know, information safely and securely. And uh, please stay safe and stay healthy. And um, yeah, reach out to any of us if you need any help, and and we'll be more than happy to uh, help out in whichever way we can. Danya, Wendy, thank you once again for being with us today. It was a pleasure talking to you.